Good evening, everybody. We're going to get started with worship in about a minute, so please start finding your way to your seats. <laughs> I appreciate that, Wade. You got my back, bro. <laughs> Okie dokie. Okay, here we go. Two. Gotcha. Well, good evening, everybody. I know the food was amazing, and so people. Um, <laughs> So, everybody get on your feet. We're going to sing some songs. Time is filled with different sounds. Not other than you can have. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to his hand. To God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Build, Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Trust in Him who will not leave you. Whatsoever you may bring, if by earthly friends forsaken, still more closely to Him cling. You've got to hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. When your journey is completed, if to God you have been true, there and friend the home in glory, your so will you. You've got to hold to God's unchanging hand. You've got to hold to His hand. To God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. You've got to hold His hand. To God's unchanging hand. You've got to hold to His hand. To God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hands. Amen. We are so grateful for our PowerPoint and Amen. <laughs> oh man. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. 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 And he, and he will lift you up. And he, and he will lift you up. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. 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 That's it. Like me, that's it. That's it. like me. Once was lost, but now I'm found. Once was lost, but now I'm found. Oh, 
first begun. Then when we first begun. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. 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 And He will lift you up. And He will lift you up. Amen. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me. Your love is around me, your love carries me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah. Love is surprising, I can feel it rising, all the joy that's growing deep inside of me. And every time I see you, all your goodness shines through, and I can feel this God so rising up in me. Hallelujah, 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 your love makes me sing, hallelujah. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me. When I am surrounded, your love carries me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing hallelujah. Take a moment and be seated. Amen. On. Check, check. All right. Good evening. In the words of the Apostle Peter, it is good for us to be here. Amen. We're not going to put up any shelters, but it is just good to be together. It's been an amazing weekend so far, and we're not done yet. We have a lot to go. Uh, my name is Tim Schmidt. I'm from Northwest Arkansas. And uh, my wife and I have the opportunity, privilege, and pleasure of serving the church there. And uh, I get the opportunity right now to introduce a man that needs no introduction. Vince Hawkins is a husband to an amazing woman, Robin Hawkins. He's a dad to four beautiful daughters. If you've ever met his daughters, they are just amazing. Every one of them are amazing. You know, I have a personal connection with Vince. I left the church for a few years. I don't recommend it. Um, when I came back, Vince had moved to St. Louis, and uh, he studied the Bible with me to help me be restored. And his uh, wife studied with my wife, and I was uh, restored at Vince's house, and then I baptized my wife in a horse trough in Vince's backyard. You know, Vince is from Louisiana, but he was born again in a church planting in Lincoln, Nebraska. Vince started out in a small church. He got uh, his history degree there in Nebraska, played some football as well. And, uh, you know, currently he's getting his master's degree in missional leadership. Vince is a constant learner. He's always studying. He's a history major, so he's always just learning things. He's a sponge when it comes to knowledge and learning. I don't know anyone else who has a heart for small churches like Vince. He has a passion for small churches, probably because he was converted in a small church. He served in the ministry in Los Angeles and Denver and St. Louis and Lincoln, led the church in Columbia, Missouri for 17 years. Columbia has always been a sending church, 
since Vince was there. You know, he's probably raised that church up two or three times and continued to send off these college students into the world. Baptized tons of people, constantly sending out. Vince was constantly being recruited by larger churches. He'd go and just all over the world, churches were like, hey, come over here. You can be in this big church. He's like, I'm good. I want to stay here in this church. I want to stay here in this region and help people. You know, as a small church leader, he served as a delegate for the Heartland region. Now he serves as chairman of our region, as well as serving on the campus committee for years. Vince has raised up numerous evangelists. One is standing next to me right now. Uh, Janice Abelio was here earlier. He had to leave. He's now leading the church in Columbia, raised up by Vince. I would not be in Arkansas today leading the church that we're leading if it weren't for Vince's direction and leadership. Vince has talked me off the ledge several times as well. And, you know, Vince is never afraid to say what needs to be said. And I respect that. Vince could tell you that you're ugly and your mama dresses you funny. And afterwards, you'd give him a big hug and thank him and walk away feeling better about yourself. His smile is infectious. He's one of our fellowship's greatest song leaders. You know, Vince has, uh, there's a lot of things that could be said about Vince, but I, I think the greatest thing anybody could say is just he is a man of God. Brian's going to pray for us. We're going to have one more song, and then I want you to give your hearts and attention to Vince Hawkins. Let's pray. Amen. What's going on, family? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. God, we thank you for life. Thank you the, for the health that we have, the clothes on our back, Father, the roof over our head, the barbecue digesting in our stomachs, God. Great conversations, iron sharpen, uh, sharpening iron moments, Father. Great teachings and conviction and lessons and workshops and time to reflect. And we pray you, you would renew our minds right now, Father, that we would hit a reset button in our minds and our hearts and our souls and sit at Vince's feet and learn and use him to, to speak powerfully. I pray the Holy Spirit would guide him. You would move him to the side and you would speak powerfully through him. God, his life speaks a lot. His passion speaks a lot, Father. He, uh, we love him so much. He cares for so many people, God. He is like a, a, a black spiritual father to me, God. He, uh, there's no, no man that's impacted me more on this earth than him. And uh, we pray that you uh, would use him, God, his passion would ooze out, and that we'd leave here wanting to have even deeper relationships with one another and wanting to have even deeper relationships with you, God. We pray that the ripple effect of his faith would continue to spread across our world, across our nation, across the states, and that we could carry out your will and imitate his faith in many ways. God, we love you. We're so grateful for your grace and your love and your son. And it's in, his, it's in your son Jesus' name we come to you and pray now. Amen. Amen. I'll stand again, and we're going to sing Hard Fighting Soldier. So I'm going to tell you what, there is nothing like a room this size with 100 ministers, 100 mm -hmm. plus ministers singing yeah. at you. Right at you. You guys are filled with so much joy and so much for love for Christ. Like, it is incredible. I can feel it coming at me. It's, I'm, t I'm not even kidding you. It's incredible. So give it right here with Hard Fighting Soldier. Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield. Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield. Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield. And I'll be bringing souls to Jesus for the service that I yield. I got a helmet on my head and in my hand a sword and shield. I got a helmet on my head and in my hand a sword and shield. I got a helmet on my head and in my hand a sword and shield. And I'll be bringing souls to Jesus by the service that I yield. You know that Jesus is my captain and he fights my battle still. He has never lost a battle and you know he never will. I got the word for my soul and I got faith for my shield. And I'll be bringing souls to Jesus by the service that I yield. And when I die, let me die in the service of the Lord. And when I die, let me die in the service of the Lord. 
and when I die, let me die in the service of the Lord. And I'll be bringing souls to Jesus by the service that I yield. Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier. Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier. Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier. And I'll be bringing souls to Jesus. Amen. Now let's be seated. Man, that introduction was off the hook. Kind of feeling like, who is Tim talking about? I just, first of all, it would not be, it would not be appropriate for me to say anything without thanking Joe and Rob for planning this. Uh, thank you so much. And I've never been to Eau Claire in my life. And this is experience. I got to tell you this. Joe Pede was leading Omaha, Nebraska when I moved to Columbia, Missouri. It was a pretty chaotic time in our fellowship. <laughs> and uh, I remember as soon as leading my family in Omaha, Nebraska. And then I met Joe. And uh, very impressed by Joe. Uh, we played golf. He cheated me oh, yeah. in uh, oh. golf. I'll never forget oh. that. Uh, but no, Joe's got game. He's got golf game, and uh, we play golf. And I fell in love with the guy. And uh, so, but uh, we were on a conference call, and then Joe said he was moving to Eau Claire, Wisconsin, to lead a church. And it was he and his wife and his kids. And I thought, well, he won't be faithful in a few years. <laughs> I know that guy won't be faithful in a few. His wife probably will hang on because she's amazing. <laughs> And I kept seeing him at conference. I'm like, Joe, you're so faithful. Amen. <laughs> and he kept saying, like, now I'm here. And he's actually leading a church. This guy's doing awesome. Praise God. Give it up for the peds. Amen. <laughs> God is working and moving through that guy. Tim Schmidt is a very, very, very dear friend of mine. I'm talking about relationships here tonight. And so my title is Look Around. And, um, you know, so many great relations. Even as I look around this room, there's Shannon Van Zee in here, who's a warrior, overcame cancer, and just a warrior. He and Janella are amazing. Wade Cook is here. Wade Cook and I probably shouldn't sit together. But Wade Cook, I got to tell you this. I was a baby Christian. I was at the University of Nebraska. I was on the football team. They were trying everything in the world to keep me faithful. I became a Christian in this little bitty white church in Lincoln, Nebraska. It's awkward. I walked into the church service, came to visit, sat in the back. It was in those days when it was a little mission team. And you know the faith. We set up 100 chairs. There's only 30 disciples. We're going to have a lot of visitors. But if you don't set up the chairs, they won't come, you know? I don't know. They might have had 50 at service. There were a lot of empty chairs. And, of course, I took the one all the way in the back. And they're all turning around looking at me, waving me up. I'm like, no, no, I'm not coming up there. It's you people. But I became a disciple in that church. And they just loved me and wrapped their arms around me and cared for me in ways. I mean, changed my life. I grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana, inner city New Orleans. Regularly had gunshots in my neighborhood. The project was right across the street. Hear gunshots regularly. I despised white folk. You know what I'm saying? And I became a disciple in this little church. And I mean, they just love me. But I remember thinking, I'm not going on dates with any of these sisters in this church. It's too awkward. It's too weird. <laughs> And so they sent me on a trip to Denver, Colorado, and Wade picked me up from the airport. And we drove to Boulder. And I was just going out there to share a testimony and to go on a date. And I didn't know anything. I'm just sort of trying to survive. And I'll never forget, he drove me around 
campus of University of Colorado, which I hated, but he drove me around anyway. <laughs> and I'll never forget this. We were bonded for life after this. We're driving around. I'm a little bit taken back at this whole experience. And right before we get ready to get out of the car, he goes, bro, I got to confess something. And I'm a baby Christian. Maybe I've been a Christian maybe a month. And this guy who had been a Christian a few years already starts confessing sin to me. And so what do you do? I'm overwhelmed. I just go, I got sin. I got to confess too, I guess. <laughs> I think I just made something up because I didn't want him to feel awkward. <laughs> but that guy was, and I've been bonded for life. He was in my wedding, and Wade is an amazing man of God. And so, and he's an elder now. That's hard to believe, but the guy's an elder. <laughs> anyway, I look around this room. I'm just blown away at the men in here. I can go on and on. I can just talk about my relationships in this room. But you probably want me to do some Bible teaching or at least share some things. I will tell you that I am just a product of Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, and resurrected. God raised me from the dead. And um, I have no business being alive, much less standing in front of you talking about anything. It is nothing but the grace of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to share. And so uh, my title is Look Around. The days of disconnect, dishonesty, disloyalty, disrespect, distrust, and dysfunction are over. Amen? Amen. I hope and pray that this, re this retreat charges you, challenges you, and commissions you to make a greater impact on your local congregations, but to make a greater impact on your geographical regions, and to make a greater impact on God's kingdom. Amen? Amen. And that's going to happen because of life-giving relational opportunities like we have here. In this room are some life-giving relational opportunities. And you've just got to look around and you've got to soak it in. And they're everywhere you go. They're in your churches, but they're in your, they're in your region as well. They're all around the kingdom. And, and listen, it is not a stretch for me to say that without spiritual, connected, accountable, encouraging church leaders around you, you're just not going to become who God has created you to be. You're not going to make it. If, you don't, if you're not connected, if you don't have accountable and encouraging other church leaders in your life, men and women, you aren't going to become all you need to be for God. I hope you have many life-giving relationships. I hope you're not isolated and separated from the brothers and sisters who can give you so much life, strengthen you and encourage you and just inspire you beyond what your, your wildest dreams. I'm telling you, I got people like that in my life. And I'm so grateful. For, I'm so grateful for John Lusk. John Lusk moved to St. Louis, Missouri when I was in Columbia. He took over for the guy that studied the Bible with me, Kurt Simmons. I disliked John from the moment I heard about him. <laughs> How dare he take over? It was a chaotic time. And John came in, and I just didn't like him. I was immature. And then I just got to sit down and spend time with him and talk to him. And then I heard him preach. And I thought, this guy can preach. I mean, I don't know if I like him or not, but this guy can <laughs> preach. I mean, that guy can preach. And so I just thought, I've never heard anyone preach like him. And so I, I concocted this whole plan. John, you want to come? And I got the Heartland Church leaders together. I said, we're going to have John, Lon John Lusk come to, Denver, come to uh, Columbia, Missouri, and he's going to do a, a, a two-day workshop on preaching. And the church leaders were kind of like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, you guys got to come because I need this. Amen? <laughs> and I convinced the church leaders in the heartland to come to Columbia in my living room. John, for two days, six hours a day, sat there and taught us how to preach. He was teaching me. Forget the rest of those jokers. Amen? <laughs> 
I was taking notes. I recorded the whole thing, and I didn't give anybody the recordings, amen? <laughs> but it changed the way I preached. It changed my life. And it certainly changed my perspective on who John was. And it changed my relationship with him. And the guy comes up to me now, and he's always so inspiring and so encouraging. I hope I grow up to be like John Lusk. Amen? Look around. You know, one of my favorite things to do on Sunday morning is to look around our service. Is to look around at the people in the room. You know, I moved to St. Louis, and I'll just share this. Is this being recorded? Maybe it is. I don't know. But I'll just share this. I moved to St. Louis, and, and the thing is, is, you know, the stage is lit up, and the audience is dark. I hate that. I hate that. Because I can't see who's in the room. All I can see is those jokers on stage, you know? So I said, turn on the lights. Why, why are we sitting in the dark? I'd ask her, why are we sitting in the dark? We don't know. We don't know. I guess people want anonymity when they worship. I mean, but not in our church. I said, turn up the lights so we can see who's in the room. I started discipling brothers in a, a brother in a singles ministry, and, and I'm in a discipling relationship. He wasn't at a men's midweek, and he wasn't at Sunday, so I called him just this week. I said, hey, dude, you weren't at midweek, and you weren't here. He said, you didn't see me. He says, 300 people, you missed me? I said, yeah, I'm looking around, dude. I'm looking for you. He goes, oh, man, that's impressive. I said, dude, I'm looking around. I'm looking for everyone in the church. We got to look around because that's how we build relationships, amen? That's how we build relationships in our congregations, but that's how we build relationships in our regions, and that's how we're going to build life-giving relationships in our kingdom. Amen? Amen. You know, they say every human on the planet is connected in some way to one another. It's a chain of acquaintances, right? That at any point, we're within five links or six degrees of someone else. In 1967, a psychologist named Stanley Milgram, you guys know this story? conducted an experiment in which he sent packets or packages to hundreds of individuals in Kansas and Nebraska. Heartland, amen. 1967, he told them the ultimate goal was for those packages to get to one or two targets living in Boston. They simply had to send the package to a friend who would then send it to another friend and so on and so on. The results show that with an average of six acquaintances, the target, the final member in the chain, was reached. In 1967, with no Facebook and probably not even phones, in many cases. I mean, not everybody had a phone or you had a party line, amen? Just send the package to a friend who then would send it to another friend. Who then would send it to another friend? Isn't that amazing? Relationships are powerful, amen? I know growing up as a disciple in the kingdom, I, I just always love the power of relationships. I love that I could be talking to Glenn Petruzzi, and within probably 10 minutes, we were talking about someone that we knew, maybe even on the other side of the country. It didn't take long because we were, we were just connected, Amen. We do love really well. We take good care of one another. We're in each other's lives, amen? We just do relationships extremely well. It is, I believe, what God wants us to be. And I think when we're doing relationships well, we are building something that is absolutely indestructible. We have to be people who are always building relationship. As ministers, we are in the relationship business. We can never get isolated. We can never get disconnected. There's no more dishonesty. There's no more how are you doing like, oh, I'm okay. No, no. How are you doing? Let's get down to it. Let's not, you know, we don't need to spend a long time. You remember those days when even a guy like Wade and I who didn't know each other at all, we're just together, pick me up from the airport, drive me to my location. Within an hour of being together, we're confessing sin to one another. Amen. I don't know who he is. He doesn't know me, but we're now bonded for life. You with me? Those opportunities, they still exist today. Are you with me? I think God cares about relationships, and so we're going to go back to a breakdown in relationship. Amen? 
in Genesis chapter 4. Genesis 4. You know the story well, but it's always good to read it again. Amen? <laughs> Genesis 4, verse 1 through 10. Abel, I'm sorry, Ab uh, Adam lay with his wife Eve. She became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother? I don't know, he replied, am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen! Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. You know, we see a breakdown in relationship. And we see a tragic story here. Of course, God had a plan through it all. But what a tragic story of two brothers who really are, from all I can tell, they, they're trying to be godly. They're at least trying to bring their offering to God. They're trying to be righteous. They're trying to be godly. They're trying to be spiritual. But one of them gets, gets a little selfish, gets a little envious or a little jealous, and he kills his brother. And the principle, God says, you are, I think, he asked Cain the question, where is your brother? And, and, and Cain, am I my brother's keeper? And I think the rest of the Bible, what is spent answering, yes, you are your brother's keeper. Yes, you are. You are totally responsible for your brother. The Hebrew word here, shamar, it means to attend to your brother. For keeper, it means to be attentive. It means to be careful. It means to be a bodyguard. It means to charge. It means to defend, to diligently keep, to be a doorkeeper, to give heed, to even be indignant, to observe, to protect, to take note, and to be in waiting. To be your brother's keeper, Means all of those things and some. God, what God was saying to Cain, you, you are your brother's keeper. You are to wait for your brother. You are to be attentive to your brother. You are to bodyguard your brother. You got to be careful with your brother. You're going to even be indignant sometimes. And that indignation is totally justified because you love your brother so much. Because you care so deeply, they even sense your indignation coming on, and they're not put off by it. They know it's coming. They even want it. They expect it, right? Because they know you protect them. I'll give my life for you. You are your brother's keeper. Cain, you're supposed to be watching out for your brother. You're supposed to be looking around, making sure no one attacks him. You're the guy of the field. You should have been looking out. You should have been watching his back. You not only were not watching his back, but you hurt your brother. You not only weren't looking around and paying attention, but you are the problem, Cain. You are not your brother. You are your brother's keeper. And it's interesting you look at God's two questions to, you might say, to Adam, right? One of them is is. Where are you, Adam? Where are you? Right? When Adam sins in the garden, 
He's hiding. And God goes, where are you? And then later on he says, where is your brother? To the sons, he says, where is your brother? Your relationship with God, your relationship with brother, your brother, it matters to God. These are big questions God will ask us. Where are you as a church leader? I appreciate all the lessons today. Rob did a great job last night. Just where are you in your relationship with God? Where are you? This is a good question for us always to be asking. Where am I? We're sitting out talking to John today. John, you know, I think Joel talked about this. I wasn't here, but I heard all about Joel is constantly checking where he is. That's what the sabbaticals and all of that. He's just going out. Where am I? Where am I at with God? I got to get grounded. That's a big question for God. But don't underestimate the second question. Where is your brother? Look around. Are you watching out for your brother? Are you paying attention to where he's at? Are you bodyguarding your brother? Are you attentive? Do you even know? Are you even attentive? Do you even know what's going on with your brother? Have you even checked? We got so many, what, means of communication today. You can text your brother. You can call your brother. You can Facebook your brother or your sister, amen. Do you, do you even know how they're doing? You call them up, they say they're doing okay. You go, thanks, that was good. I'm going to go now. Or do you go, no, no, no. How are you really doing? How is your brother doing? How are your sisters doing? Let me give you some 10 things here that I believe that keep us, and these are not new to any of us, but these are 10 things that probably keep you, like me, from being attentive and being a bodyguard for our brother and sister. The first one we know is pride. Pride. Pride says, leave me alone. Pride says, I, period. Do, period. Not, period. Need, period. Your, period. Help! Exclamation point. We know the verses, Proverbs 8, 13. The Lord hates pride. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. 13, 10. 16, 18, pride goes before the fall, amen? In the book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis said, pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind, pride is. He goes on to say in that same book, it was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride keeps us from being close to our brothers and sisters. Let me ask you this. When's the last time you looked around, a brother in your church, out of your church particularly? I think you need church leaders in your life, amen? Small church leaders. We need church leaders in your life. I gave you those illustrations of my life because I just, I needed John Lusk in my life. And I didn't even necessarily, initially, I love him now. I think he's amazing now. And Barry makes it a lot easier to love him, amen? She's just amazing. (laughs) But I knew I needed John. I knew I needed, in Columbia, Missouri, 117 miles away from his a church three at the time, four times the size of my church. I need St. Louis. And whoever's leading it, I need them in my life. But when's the last time you confessed pride? When was the last time you were discipled on your pride? You know, I think the greatest sin we in America, we struggle with, it is pride. This is our greatest sin. We're prideful. We're Westerners. We are super arrogant. It's just, it's oozing out of everything around us. It's pride in every culture. There's pride in politics. There's pride in sports. There's pride everywhere. And it, it infects us. When's the last time you you just got open about your pride? You see, I think pride is the number one reason our churches probably aren't growing. We're just too prideful. 
we're too prideful to get help in our lives sometimes. You guys with me? Amen? Yeah. I know that's true of me. Yeah. I can tell you, I can go back and I can look. It's the moments when I was prideful, I didn't want to get any help. It's when I was just a little disgruntled with Kansas City, and I just didn't want to call a guy there that was leading the church and talk to him about something or get his input. It was those kind of months and years where things seemed to be the most difficult or the hardest. But then when I called, and I called Charlie Sawyer, and I just said, look, I got this situation. I don't even know if you can help me with it. And he would give me some wisdom, and I'd be like, wow, that was profound. What an idiot I am. And it just got me a little bit unstuck. Or just calling someone in the church the same size of mine and say, bro, I don't know. You know, your church is small. My church is small. I know that you need to go to a big church and get help. But you got any thoughts about this? And the guy would say something like, that's awesome. That's amazing. It's those moments when, 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 when God just moves because you're just being humble. And God knows we don't know what we're doing. Amen. I mean, I look at Joel today, I'm going, that guy is brilliant. Yeah. All the stuff he had there, that guy was he's a genius. 16 years he did all that. I'm thinking, I was in Columbia for 16 years. I did nothing. I don't have, a, I don't have anything. I don't have one pamphlet. He's got like 10 of them. <laughs> don't you hate that guy? <laughs> look around. Pride, man. Pride is a killer. The other one is selfishness. Rob talked about this the other night, last night, focusing on ourselves, wanting our own, own way. It will eventually ruin relationships. Selfishness, which is even self-righteousness a little bit, but just selfishness. What can you do for me? You know, when you make the call, it's all about you, right? It's what can the person do for you? The third one is negativity. This is my biggest, this is why John Lusk was so good for me. John doesn't have a negative bone in his body, I don't think. John is always Mr. Inspiration, Mr. Positive. It's disgusting, but that's how he is. He's just so inspiring. And I'm like, the sky is falling, you don't understand. The other shoe's about to drop. Look, it's dropping. I'm watching it drop. <laughs> my people are moving away. My best friend is moving. Yes, he's leading a church, but he should stay here with me. Can't move to lead a church. It's my best friend. When Brian left, I cried. I don't want Brian to go out and do well spiritually. I want him to stay here with me. <laughs> Forget that evangelist thing. Just stay here with me. You're my friend. Selfish, negativity. My people don't sing out on Sunday morning. My song leader is just bad. I mean, I wish I had a facility like Joe, right? I mean, there's all kind of negative things we could be thinking. Right. Mark Twain said, don't walk away from run negative people. Run! <laughs> but I want to let you know that, hey, there are negative people. They need God, amen? There are negative church leaders like me. I thank God that John Lusk would meet me at that Denny's in Warrington, Missouri. And sit down and listen to me be negative. And one day he said, you know, you got to take responsi more responsibility for your life. I'm just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> just cut me to the heart. But we, negative people, they need discipling. Yes. And if you're negative, you need discipling, amen? amen? I'll tell you another thing that hurts relationship is criticism. Finding fault with people. If you're like me, you could walk into a room and find the problems immediately. In a nanosecond, I can see. Well, look at the stage. Look what's messed up. Why is the part singers that? Why are they wearing that? Well, I can find everything going on wrong. I can criticize, criticize, criticize. Amen? Amen. But criticism, it hurts relationships. Yeah. The next one is competition. You know, competition can be good, healthy, and fun sometimes. But sometimes competition can just lead to some, some pretty negative things. Yeah. Being overly competitive. You know, when, when, when someone moves from your church 
to another church, right? You kind of feel that little competition, right? That's going to affect my numbers. Have you, have you, if you're a small church, have you ever honestly thought, like, when someone moves away, I ain't going to get no pay raise, man. I just, just you know, <laughs> like your best giver leaves, you think, that's it, man. Now I'm going to have to get a job, you know? <laughs> Anybody else thought? Okay, I thought that. Maybe you haven't. Don't put your hand up. Man. Come on, bro. The rest of you self-righteous people in here. Obviously, Joe doesn't have that issue, but the rest of us have, amen? <laughs> Envy. I want their growth. I want their leaders. I want their board member. I want their budget, amen? I want that church building. I want their interns. I want that house, that credit score. I mean, you name it. I just envy... What the big church has or what that other church has. But it hurts relationships. It keeps you from being close. If you're envying what the other churches have, you can't be close. You don't want to call them and get input from them. You're too busy envying their stuff. A lack of forgiveness. I mean, some of us, we, we still got baggage. We still got people we have to forgive. And you may have even said, you know, I told him I forgave him. I don't want to say it again. Say it again. It'll probably be good. Amen? Yeah. It's good. It'll be practice. They need to forgive you 77 times 7, you know, for, for even you forgiving them. Amen? But, boy, you know, some of us, we're struggling to forgive. Yeah. We keep saying things, well, you know, in the old days. Just let it go. Amen? Oh. Just let it go. Right. Yeah. The era of disrespect is over. Amen? Oh. This is a new day. Amen? Right. We're moving forward. You with me? And we're part of that. The other one is disloyalty. Distrust. It drives a stake between people. It destroys relationships. You know, people need to be able to trust you. If someone's open with you about something going on in life, hopefully it doesn't just make its way around the region or make its way around the kingdom. Amen? Hopefully you're the kind of person you're loyal and people can trust you. Amen? See, that's looking out for your brothers and sisters. Right. That's creating the kind of relationships that are just going to sustain the kingdom. It's going to help your church to grow. It's going to help them to grow, amen. I'm not saying cover anybody's sins up. You help them get help. You hold them accountable. But we're not going to be accountable. We're not going to gossip about one another's sins, amen. The other one, dishonesty, I said this. How you doing, brother? I'm good. But are you open about your marriage? If you're married, are you open about your sex life? There's single people in here. You know, married folks have sex. It's a thing, amen? It's a thing. Are you open about your finances? Are you open about your purity? Are you open about your parenting? Are you open about your frustrations and your fears? Are you frustrated with your church? Are you stuck? Are you open about your shame? I struggle with shame personally. I've struggled with it a long time. I, I can just recall there was always some older black woman saying, shame on you, boy. Shame on you. So I'm blaming old black women for my shame problems, you know. Shame on you. Barry knows that. She's from Louisiana. She's always like, shame on you. I'm like, oh, stop it. So I got all this shame now. <laughs> but I've had so many issues in my life. I was sexually molested when I was a little boy. I was shamed for a long No one, I didn't, I didn't tell anyone about that. For a long time, I'm trying to be the football stud and a cool guy, and I got this baggage, you know. I was just ashamed of that, and I held that in. I was ashamed that my biological father wasn't in my life. He's a Vietnam vet, came back from Vietnam. He was jacked up. My mother went off to college. He went the other way in life. I was ashamed not to have a biological father. My mother married my stepdad, who I, I was even, I was ashamed of my stepdad because my biological father is a big, strong dude. He's big like me. He's 6'3", he's big. 
My mother married this little guy who liked to sing. You know what I mean? He's a, he was a singer, you know? He's a nice guy. I'm going, I want my dad. I don't want the little dude who sings. So now we all benefit from me singing, amen? <laughs> Praise God for that singer, amen? But when you're a little kid, you don't get that. He's got you in the choir. You go, I don't want to sing in the choir. I want to play football. Get in that choir. I'm like, oh. But I struggle with shame. I never wanted to be on stage singing. I was the biggest kid. And people coming up, I mean, I looked like, I looked weird. I felt weird. I probably didn't look weird. I just felt weird. I was ashamed of how dark my skin is. People, make, black people make fun of how black you are. This is a real thing. Like black people in my community, you're so black. Your mama left you in the oven too long. I'm like, oh, I'm too black. I'm too black. I'm too black. What's with that? I'm not articulate enough. I'm not smart enough. I struggle with all of this shame. I'm so grateful for the kingdom. These people just built me up and strengthened me and gave me hope and courage. But are you open about your shame? You look, do you have anyone you can be open with about whatever you're ashamed of? There are some things we probably need to be ashamed of, amen? But not all the things I was, all right? And the last thing is what, what, what hurts relationships is busyness. You're just too busy. You're too busy to go to the small church leaders conference. Are you too busy to drive over and get with that sister or brother? But they're like four hours away. You know, I went over to Siberia. Black man in Siberia. It's a, it was a fun. It was awesome. I went over to Siberia. Their shortest drive to get together is like 10 hours. I mean, they just drive to get together. I mean, their flights from one part of Siberia to the next is like flying from here to Moscow. It takes forever for them to get around their country. And yet, if they have the money, they come together. They catch trains, overnight trains, 12 hours to go get a detail. And they go. But that's what it takes for them to be connected. And here we are in our American cars. You know, I'm going to drive three hours. That's going to take me all day. You know what I mean? Then I got to turn around and come back. I got to get in bed by 930. You know what I'm saying? But we're just too busy or too lazy, one or the other, to even just make a phone call, to attend the conference. We're just too busy to send a text message, to be involved in each other's lives. You see, these are 10 little things or sins, you might say, that I know I've slipped into in the past. And I'll be tempted with them again in my life. And so will you. And the last question is, is what have you done? You know, God asks Cain the question, what have you done what did you do? You, what have you done? There's a sense of indignation in this. What did you do? What are you doing? Or what will you do from here? Your brother's blood. It cries out to me. You know, I think we just get a little too accustomed to our brother's just sort of struggling. You know, we watched John Wick last night. John Wick 3. And before you judge me, I didn't see one or two, amen? But there were a lot of ministers in here at John Wick 3. And it's a very violent movie. The body count in John Wick 1. I went home because I couldn't sleep. I was disturbed. So I looked up the body count and John Wick 1 84 dead John Wick 2 128 dead I think there were 84 that died in the first 15 minutes of this last one 
There were 250 people killed. At least. If you're judging me right now, stop it, amen? <laughs> Brian made me go. I didn't want to go. He said Keanu Reeves. I thought it was Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. You know what I'm saying? I thought it was a sequel to that. But raise your hand if you've seen it. Come on. Give glory to God. Amen. <laughs> I think sometimes we are desensitized to the amount of violence that's happening and even some of the things that are going on around us in the lives of our brothers and sisters. And so you got a brother in your re geographical region who's prideful or a sister, and you know they're prideful, but you just let it go. You know they're prideful, you never take the time to say, can I talk to you about something? I'm just saying, I could be wrong. You'll figure out how to bring it up, but you, you don't want to talk about it. You don't want to have that tough conversation. You're just, de de you desensitize yourself to their pride, to their dis. Every time I talk to you, you're, you're always good. You're always good, really. This is, are things always good? That's a little weird if things are always good. There's never any difficulties in your life. And I just sense that you're being a little selfish, maybe. Or you seem really critical. Or just negative. Or just, are you even willing to say what John said? After I spill it all out, John goes, you know, you got to take more responsibility for your life. I'm going, oh, man, that hurt. That was so good. But you seem overly competitive. And a little competition is good, but... You seem really anxious and frantic or, or competitive. You seem envious or you seem like you have things that you have not forgiven. What do we need to do to get you past that? Are you willing to have those conversations? I mean, you see it. It's all around you. You see these things. And let me tell you, you we, the small church leaders, I mean, we are going to be the catalyst for change in our churches, but in our regions and in the kingdom. It's not going to happen with the big churches. It's going to happen with you. You can have those crucial conversations. You can bring it up. You can go talk to the big church leader and say, I'm sensing that you're being a little prideful. Have that guy. They need that. No one else asks them because everyone's going, well, that's a big church leader. They know everything. They don't know everything. Trust me. They're struggling just like us. But we're struggling as well. Are you willing to have those kind of conversations? Are you just desensitized to the sin going on around you and in our culture? We've got to wake up. And we've got to realize that we need to be catalysts for change. When you look around, what do you see? Are you seeing your brothers and sisters in need? Are you seeing the things that God wants you to be seeing? Are you looking around to be an agent of change or to help? Are you looking around to build life-giving relationships that really change you and change the people around you and change your region and change the kingdom of God, amen? They also change your church. There's nothing better than standing in front of your church and says, I was confessing my sin the other day to this brother over there, and last week I confessed my sin to that guy. There's nothing better. The church goes, hey, man, he's confessing his sin. Praise God. We surely saw it. <laughs> Trust me, they see it. The days of disconnect, dishonesty, disloyalty, disrespect, distrust, and dysfunction are over. I hope and pray that we'll walk out of here charged, challenged, and commissioned to make a greater impact in our churches, in our regions, and in God's kingdom. By simply looking around and finding life giving relational opportunities, amen? Because without spiritual, connected, accountable, and encouraging church leaders in your life,
and around you, you're never going to become the kind of church leader that God wants you to become. Look around. God bless you. Vince, thank you so much. Boy, what an amazing choice by God to give us this final evening session inspirational uh, message. You know, I loved how Vince lives out what he preached about. And uh, Vince, we're just so grateful that you, having Vince moved from Columbia to just leading the St. Louis Church, plenty to do, but took the time out to be with us. And we're super, super thankful for you, Vince, not only just being here, but your leadership in Columbia over the years, in St. Louis, and in the Heartland. Uh, we love the Heartland churches. Um, my son is a, sitting here as an incredible Nebraska fan, maybe a little, because he was born in Nebraska, so maybe a little starstruck that there's a Husker sitting two, two rows behind him. Uh, but uh, anyways, we love the kingdom. Thank you, Vince. We love you. Um, and I didn't cheat at golf. I was just better. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. You want to, you got anything? I got a few things that you want. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to, to, uh, thank, uh, Nicole again. And it's not all that back row back there. Go ahead. Come on. Ivy and Ianson, Grace and Eli, Nicole, could you guys all stand up? All you guys stand up, please. This is uh, a lot of our staff here in Eau Claire, and I'm just so proud of you guys, and we're so thankful. You guys have just done incredible. Ellen and Corey and Phil back there. Man, it's a, it's a lot of work. You guys are incredible. Um, we got live streaming disciples today. We got PowerPoints that we're trying to change last minute and every pre-meeting, of course. And uh, there's just never a complaint, never w whatever you need, bro. So we're super grateful uh, for you guys as well. Um, so tomorrow morning is going to be it, an amazing time, historic for our, I think it's going to be great for you guys. But it's going to be historic for our church. So um, we're so looking forward to worshiping together. Even the singers are like, we've never heard it like this before. So uh, it's exciting. So church is at 10 a.m. Listen, we don't have enough room in the parking lot when just us meet for the church. So don't, you know, come and you may just have to park on the street and walk a little bit. Sorry about that. But, you know, I guess that's one of the joys of having a full church. Amen? Um, if, if you are in the service, uh, we have a 940 uh, pre-meeting, so please be here for that. But please come early, and uh, you know, this is an amazing time of fellowship, so we get our last little moments of fellowship and meeting the Eau Claire Church. They are so looking forward to meeting you guys. Um, and then we have uh, an amazing worship service plan. Barry, Lusk, and John will be speaking, and uh, so looking forward to that. And then we do want to, before you go, we're going to want to get a picture at the end of church tomorrow. Uh, so please, you know, we'll, we'll figure that out. But, but we want to get a big picture. And um, yeah, so you want to get one tonight as well? Okay, so we want to get a picture tonight as well. So probably but what we'll do is kind of, I need some advice. How should we do that? Show, like, in front of the logo? Right. Okay. Does anybody else have any opinions? <laughs> I mean, I know this is kind of a passive, unopinionated gathering of disciples. Okay, so we're going to rush the stage, and we're going to get a picture.